What is the creator economy and why should you care? And how does it intersect with the metaverse? The topic that everyone and their grandmother seems to be talking about. I mean, are people really going to get jobs in the metaverse? Can it actually pay the bills? To find out, we're talking today with Jonathan Roz Friedman. He's the CEO of Super Social. Super Social is an interactive media company that builds amazing games, mostly on the popular gaming platform, Roblox. So if your child or the child in you loves exploring virtual worlds, you should check out some of their creations, Ghostopia, Ballista, or even Pirates vs. Ninjas. I'm a personal fan of Ghostopia. All this also makes Jan the perfect person to help us understand how creators are shaping the metaverse and gaining big communities of followers along the way. This is the seventh episode of Everything is Better with Creators, but the very first where we enter the metaverse. Roll the intro, please. Everything is Better with Creators, the podcast that takes a deep dive into all things creator economy. Produced and presented by Whaler. Whaler, we power the creator economy. With your hosts, Ashley Rudder, Emma Harmon, Jamie Goodfriend, and Marco Batozzi. Hey everyone, welcome to episode seven of Everything is Better with Creators. I'm Jamie Goodfriend, your guide to all things happening in the creator economy. Every week, myself or my colleagues, Marco Betrosi, Emma Harmon, or Ashley Rudder will be hosting this podcast. Coming up, we're getting right into this episode with our big interview. If you want to understand the importance of the metaverse, the role creators play in the metaverse, and whether or not you should actually check out the metaverse, tune in for our big interview with Jan Braz Friedman. Just a reminder that Everything is Better with Creators is brought to you by Whaler. The Whaler Way combines tech, talent, and creative social strategy to match brands with creators and produce authentic content that people really want to see. Whaler is democratizing the creative process for brands and creators by empowering a global talent network of thousands of influencers, tastemakers, creatives, and storytellers to connect with your target audience, making advertising more inclusive, diverse, and effective. Check out more at Whaler. That's W-H-A-L-A-R dot com. And now it's time to bring up the headliner of the evening. Very special. Please welcome to the stage The Big Interview. Everything is better with creators. Hello, Jan. Jan, how do you say your name appropriately? I mean, Jan is perfect. The full name is Jonathan, but Jan is perfect and much, much easier. So go for Jan. Jonathan Roz Friedman. Jonathan Roz Friedman. That was perfect, Jamie. I, I just want to make sure. Okay. So I got to ask you a question, Jan. What's the nicest really boy doing in Columbus, Ohio? Dying to ask this question. I mean, the obvious answer is love. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, I am originally from Israel, lived in London, then moved to New York. And I moved from London to New York after meeting my wife, but only after a year and a half of, 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 of meeting for the first time. The first time we actually met on a bus in Greece at the end of a WPP stream, which some of the listeners in this podcast might f- be familiar with. And uh, we got to know each other sitting on the bus on the way back to the airport. And then a year and a half later, we met for the second time. And that was the beginning of, of our relationship. And shortly after, I decided to move from London to New York. And then I was about to say the ro- the the road was quite short from New York to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, but, you know, somewhere in COVID, we decided to give Columbus, Ohio a chance, which is where my wife is from originally. And that's sort of the, the narrative. <laughs> so was Stream the reason that you met the second time too? No, the second time was after uh, our wires got crossed on Facebook, not in the company, on literally Facebook, the network. And we started chatting after a year and a half of meeting for the first time. And then somehow serendipitously, 
we decided to meet in uh, in San Francisco in the U.S. and 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 then the click was really made. Uh, and I believe very shortly after, six months after, I proposed. So you're a man that is driven by passion, which I kind of love. Or you you fall in love with projects and ideas and people, which is a really good set of characteristics for an entrepreneur and someone who I, I think of as a visionary. Uh, I just want to put a little context in this. I stalked you, which is how we got to know each other. I was working for a, a toy company and I wanted to build a branded Roblox game at the time. I was obsessed with it. And I was asking around about who knows the space, who can I learn from? And your name came up frequently uh, and I remember reaching out to you and you were so kind. And this was early. This was before anybody, this was 18 months before the hype hit. So I just want to at least say thank you for taking my calls and, and talking me through. And I asked a lot of really dumb questions. I'll probably ask a lot of dumb questions today too, but isn't that the point? We're all learning. You know, it's all about putting one dumb food before the other, right? I hope so. Cause I, dumb feet in nice shoes, but I want to <laughs> learn, but I, but I, but thank you for coming on today because especially with Roblox, especially with social gaming, there's so much noise in the system. And as a CMO and a former brand side, client side, um, marketer, I know it's really scary to ask questions that you really don't know the answers to. And so the goal today is to really ask those questions of you. So hopefully people will be emboldened to take some steps and make less mistakes and just do really great, brilliant work. So I want to talk to you about Roblox and super social and the creator economy, and we're just going to jump in. So how did you, like, what was the first time you found Roblox? You know, there is the first time and then there is the second time, which felt like a first time. But the first, first time I came across Roblox was in probably 2013 when I founded my first company, Kana, which is a computer company where the goal was to enable anyone to build and code their own computer. And so that was my first foray into the world of consumer technology and young people um, and using technology as a form of creativity, not just consumption. And there were two incredible products and platform back then. It was Minecraft and it was Roblox. Minecraft was obviously more known because it was a game and also Microsoft acquired it and that made a big splash in the news. So that was the first time I kind of came across Roblox because I was operating already in a similar space. The second time I came across Roblox was when I left my first company, Kano, and I started to observe in a more wider lens what's happening uh, in the world of consumer technology for young people and gaming. And I obviously remembered Roblox and I met with the CEO, Dave, back in 2017, went to their office and kind of got a better understanding of what's unique about it. But I still didn't fully understand the potential. And then the third one, let's say the third date we had together was early COVID, March, April, 2020. And it becomes abundantly clear to me, at least, that the next iteration of the internet will involve people spending a growing amount of time in these massive, large-scale virtual spaces with interoperable, persistent worlds, now coined the metaverse. And it was a very natural choice for me as an entrepreneur to start the journey of super social building for the metaverse on a platform like Roblox. And in a way, it all came full circle after seven years from the first time I came across Roblox in 2013. Because of that combination of coding as a consistent pathway or individuals being enabled to create, what, what, what are the parallels there? It was absolutely about the connecting tissue, which was about human empowerment. In this case, it was around young people, right? Because we were building in my company, we were building a computer that essentially enables anyone to learn to code out of the box in a really fun Lego-like experience with a physical product. What Roblox has done already then, they've built the engine that allows essentially anyone to learn to code and build the game in 3D. And so that human empowerment, that democratization of creativity 
and enabling young people to make something and ultimately also monetize, that was pretty pioneering. And, and back then, uh, and, and obviously we, we see the results of that uh, today with that creativity now in the hands of millions of people around the world who are building games, making money. Uh, and so the, con- the connecting tissue for me was always around human empowerment and unleashing the power of creativity with technology. Yeah, I don't think that's how it's getting described in the in the trades and business press. Seriously, and, and I think that's a miss. That's why I'm so excited to have you on this on this podcast today. And another thing you can think of Roblox, it is most likely the largest learn to code platform ever created. No one thinks about it like that, but it is. Because they make it so damn easy and it's the benefits are so tangible immediately and the reward because it's not like you're coding something to make the lights go on and off. You're creating your own vision of a world. And kids as young as, I mean, I have heard kids four or five are already coding on it. It it just makes sense. What's a better thing for kids than build a game, a video game of their own imagination and seeing other people play that video game? That is really the magic of what Roblox created over, over many, many years. But when people talk about this, and I've heard you talk about this before, th- there's a heritage, right? I always say there's nothing new in marketing. So, <laughs> right, you go back, there was Sims, there was Club Penguin. So there was a model for this that most marketers probably have some recollection. What's the, just spell it out, because this is probably obvious to most people, but I want you to say, what's the, what triggered it? What what went from Club Penguin and Sims and Roller Coaster Tycoon and all those immersive games that were packaged up in a box and you bought and you played sometimes on your PC, uh, so that's so quaint, to now, like this explosive public company that is the headline of almost every conversation um, I'm having or hearing. I'll, I'll use an analogy that might make some people feel more comfortable resonating with. And I will use Lego as an analogy. The Lego, the historic Lego was a bunch of blocks and pieces that you decide what you want to do with them. Lego really gave us the infrastructure. Lego created a block platform that children can use in their own imagination. And If you go and look at Lego advertising images on Google Images from the 70s, you're going to see what I'm talking about. You will see that imagination coming to life in a really organic way. That's Roblox. If you look at Lego of the 2000s, those polished, ready-made brand boxes of Lego, come build a Star Wars ship, come build a fire station, If you look at those, not to say that they're not good and not fun, but that to me is the club penguin. It's a boxed experience where you don't really have control and you can't really unleash your creativity in a way that you are where you are the builder. Roblox has built a Lego in 3D at a massive scale, and they have been building that infrastructure, Jamie, for years over years. I just want to give a, a sense of a sense of number to to the audience. Up until 2015, Roblox had probably several million dollars, several million people playing the, on the platform. Roblox today has 55 million daily active users. But you're not just talking about some prolific overnight success of a social network. You're talking about something with physics physic engine, and you're talking about a platform with its own economy. You're talking about the ability to really build almost anything that can mimic the real world and turn it into a digital 3D virtual game. That infrastructure has taken many, many years to build, but when you look at what it enabled, ultimately, it enabled millions of people to create whatever they want, as long as they can learn how to do it with the programming language, And it enabled millions of millions of other people to be part of those communities of those virtual worlds 
which in the world we live in today is becoming essentially de facto the the playground for many, many millions of, of young people. Okay, we just said so many words and it's so smart. So I need to break that down a little bit. But I, I love apologize. it. And I do want to, no, I like it. But I think this is what happens is that you're farther along in the way farther along in the learning process. And I want to make sure that we can catch everybody up. And you said some really interesting stuff. So I want to go back and break that down. But I do want to confess to something first before we do. I actually have a job in Roblox. I work at a pizza parlor and I find it very cathartic. <laughs> it's so fun. Okay. One of the strongest genres on Roblox is real jobs inside the game. And, and you know what it is? You're talking about how can we demystify this for, for, the, for the listeners. It's imagine, it's imagine play. It's pretend play. Kids have been doing it for centuries. It's not an invention. The invention is the tool set, but the, the fundamentals are exactly the same. It's imagination. It's pretend play. Kids want to work in a pizza place. They want to be a tycoon of a theme park. I've been building, te- I've been building sports teams when I was five playing Playmobil. Sports teams? Wait. Sports. I, I would take Playmobil figures I would write the name of the players because I was obsessed with sports, with, 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 with team sports. I would write the names of the players that I love and I would put it with a tape on the figures of the Playmobil character. And that's how I would build my own sports teams. <laughs> so you, your destiny, now I think I'm going to see the potential future is that you're going to launch the first organized professional sports league in Roblox and have name image likeness, sponsorship, ticket sales. In fact, we've just come up with an idea. We should stop this podcast right now and go start this. Sign me up. Uh, Maybe my teams will do better in Roblox than they do in real life because I'm a long-suffering New York Giants fan and it's painful, but I digress. Okay, I do want to understand, and I'll get back to this. Where does Super Social come in on this chronological journey? So Super Social is on the back of that sort of insight I had in early 2020, again, April 2020, really beginning of COVID, I saw this piece of of data where 2.5 billion young people below 18 are now out of school. And as someone who has been building consumer technology for young people for almost a decade, it became abundantly clear to me that this is it. This is the accelerant that is going to bring virtual worlds and these massive environments into the everyday life of many more millions of people. And it will never be the same again. Meaning- You knew that that right at the beginning of COVID. The rest of us were figuring out how to get paper towels and wipes. You're figuring out this is a business bonanza. Yes, and this is when we started Super Social, June 1st, 2020, with the idea of building iconic games and experiences for the metaverse, starting on a platform, as you can guess, Roblox. And that's when we started the company. And that's the, the sort of the, the activation of the insight was the birth of Super Social as a company. I'm still processing the fact that I swear everybody else on the planet was terrified. And you see a business opportunity and your lovely wife must have been, Jan, what are you doing? And in June, you have a company. That's, that's incredible. And what would you describe, what's the elevator pitch to describe what you're doing with Super Social now? Super Social today is a developer and publisher of metaverse games and experiences, primarily focused on the Roblox platform, but we're also starting to expand to Web3 slash blockchain, or as I like to refer to all of these as the open metaverse. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so we've got... We, there are so many words and we're going to have to and, go back and we to work, and explain. And we work, with, we work on our own original IP and we also work with, with partners, among them our brands. You wouldn't work with me when I try to, but we can get beyond that. So are you hiring creators? Do you have a, like a billion seven-year-olds and 11-year-olds that are coding away? Like who's building this for you? Well, we have, we have a team. Everyone works with, with at Super Social is a full-time team member. We work on our, on our games and experiences in-house, no matter if it's original IP that we create from scratch or if we work with brands. Uh, however, we are always uh, communicating 
and engaging with our communities, typically mostly on Discord. We always have people who want to help, want to support. Uh, for example, in one of the games that we've launched on Roblox, which I'm uh, very proud of, is called Gustopia. It's a spooky kind of role play game where some of the things that we've seen from the community aside of the typical amazing fan art and things like that, we had one um, member of the community that started his own Twitter, their own Twitter of Gustopia News. And they imagine they imagine news from the city of Gustopia based on the game, and they created a whole Twitter around it. Yes, and that guy or woman or non-definition Gustopia type being was in contact with me. It was so interesting. They were right on it as soon as I went in, and I and I had such a good time with Gustopia. So to put it into other like your studio. For Roblox, that's a simplistic way of saying it. Uh, and you, do you have, so you're creating your own IP. And are you working with brands and how do brands fit into this vision? Yes, we are. Well, first, let me say this. I believe that the opportunities for brands in terms of what can brands do and create in a platform like Roblox and and, and beyond as well are, are truly phenomenal. But with a vast range of opportunities also come the anxiety, the pressure, and the need to create things that actually make sense for the brand. Um, And so we have a lot of conversation with brands, mostly completely inbound organic interest. I didn't really have the time, nor do I have the time now to pursue brands conversations, but we are being approached by, you know, I would say a few brands every week who some of them want to just get more familiar about the Roblox platform And I'm always happy to take a call and a meeting and share my perspective about the platform and and really kind of help the brand teams to decide if this makes sense for them or not. There's a lot of, as you rightfully suggested earlier, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, And then there's brands who already come prepared, who want to experiment with something on the platform. They're not sure how, uh, they're not sure about the budget. And this is where Super Social comes in, either if it's someone who was introduced to Super Social or came directly to us, we really work with brands to define what is the experience that is right for them on the Roblox platform, what are they trying to accomplish? Is it about revenue? Is it about community building? Is it about co-creating with the new demographics uh, of under 18? Of course, uh, many majority, probably all of these brands are consumer brands. And so we constantly have conversations, um, some of which evolve to actual partnership. We now have uh, uh, projects in development of brands that I cannot disclose, but in categories like beauty and fashion and sports. Um, And I believe Roblox is providing an immense opportunity for brands to create a 3D branded experience that feels like a game, but really it's an opportunity to create brand resonance with a whole new generation that ultimately will become the next consumer in the next 10 to 20 years. And and it's a phenomenal opportunity to really start and understand why this is a paradigm shift. The big thing about these virtual worlds and, and the metaverse, which I think is important for people to keep in mind, is this is not about a game. This is a paradigm shift of human behavior. The fact that you now have billions of people who congregate in virtual worlds that for them are really the next playground, a social network, this is what they know. And when you want to imagine what are the type of experiences and brands you should create in the next 10 years, five years, 15 years, you really need to learn how these generation, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, how do they think? What do they care about? Why are they obsessed with a platform like Roblox? And the only way to do that is to interact with them. And the way to interact with them is to build things that they would want to play with and, and socialize in and ultimately be part of. I mean, that's a simple, very compelling way to think about it. But it's scary. And I have had those conversations with CFOs and CEOs. And their question is, what's it going to cost? How long is it going to take? And am I going to make money? Or when am I going to make money? So those are some fundamental things. Because again, it's it's not a hobby. So what you're saying is add into those realities, the opportunity to become future ready, as I like to say, because you're creating a focus group where 
el- where else are you going to get that kind of immediate feedback and opportunity? So that's that's a really interesting thing. Can you tell me the top three things to think about for a brand to be able to even ask you those questions so that they can really start to think about the questions they need to ask to get smart about making decisions? So the first thing is what's important for you in terms of why would you come to a platform like Roblox? Is it about generating revenue? Is it about building brand awareness? Is it about creating a community that ultimately can follow you to the physical world or e-commerce or whatever it is that you're offering, if it's a product or a service? Um, Is it about experimenting There is a lot of buzz around these domains. Is it about putting a certain amount of investment and just seeing what it's all about and what can you learn from it? So treating it more like an R&D prospect for the brand versus something with an ROI. Um, and, and, and and, And then I think there is a different piece, which is what are the brand principles or the brand aspirations that are important for you to bring to a virtual persistent world that you're going to build on, on Roblox, right? And so... What do you mean? Sorry? Like, give me an example on that one. An example of that would be if you are a fashion brand, I genuinely don't think at the moment your motivation as a brand, I might be wrong, but that's just my perspective. I don't think your motivation for coming to a platform like Roblox should be revenue generation. I think the more immediate revenue generation is probably continuing to double down on your e-commerce operations. So you can actually sell uh, uh, clothing and items that, that, that consumers are looking for. However, I do believe that in the long term, people, especially these new generations, are going to care about their virtual appearance at least as much and potentially more than they do with their physical appearance. And I'll give you a data point. One out of five users, daily users on Roblox changes their outfits, their avatar outfits every day. That's around 10 million people who are changing their avatar outfits every day. I would claim that that's a human behavior. That's what we do every day. We change our outfits every day. Every day you want to look different. Every day you want to look special and cool. As we spend more and more, as these people, these young generations spend more and more time in virtual spaces, they will continue and consume these type of virtual goods. And so it may not be the immediate goal for a consumer brand in fashion to monetize and generate revenue in a platform like Roblox, but it could well be a place where you can learn about the taste and and creative aspirations of those those audiences. So, for example, you may want to consider building a metaverse e-commerce experience inside your game world. For example, with Gostopia, we've built a department store that is called for Ikea, where you can purchase decorative item for your spectacular uh, haunted mansions. So if you're a fashion brand, you can build a game world that has a metaverse e-commerce immersive 3D shop where you can potentially even test and experiment with layout of a physical store. You can experiment with new designs and come up with creative clothing ideas that you would never let your designers create in the physical world. You can create a whole fashion collection that is designed bottom up for a metaverse generation. That doesn't mean the monetization of that is going to be the most important thing. What's more important in my mind for a fashion brand that wants to stay relevant for the next 20 years is what can we learn about that generation now? Because they are 12, 15, and they're literally two, three years away of being ready to purchase some of our items. And just one more point, that doesn't mean that there isn't an immediate opportunity because we can connect that to a physical commerce very soon. So there could be a linear uh, line from the metaverse experience to a physical shopping. But again, it's all very early and experimental. And so I wouldn't recommend the chief marketing officer to create a pitch to the CEO where we're going to invest a million dollar and I'm telling you, we're going to generate five million in revenue. I wouldn't promise anything like that to the CEO unless you are very safe with your position in the company and instead come with, here is a baseline expectation. My goal is to at least recuperate the investment 
Best case scenario, we do five to 10 X, but let me tell you what's the most important thing. We're going to start building relationship with the next generation of consumers of our brand. That is priceless. I, I want to see the CMOs who have their jobs. Cause you know, the average tenure is only 18 months having the second conversation because it's scary. And I think, but I do think that there is enough enough energy around this idea that if you don't have a metaverse strategy as a brand, especially for this age group, then it's probably time that you're on the, the minority. But the law, it's a long-term, short-term challenge in a business because you're investing for the long-term here. And what I have told many people is that the sooner you get in and learn the more you'll know and the less mistakes you'll make as more as the market gets more crowded. And I think that's a particularly important thing. But for the audience, you said a million dollars. Is it is that the is that the number that we're looking at? Is it a minimum is it a minimum to spend of a million dollars? Or can you what's your range? I have my opinion on what you can do, but what's your assessment so they also have a sense of the financial implications here? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Look, I think to to experiment. And by the way, I want to echo what you said uh, a minute ago. I absolutely agree with you. The best way to learn is to experiment, put your money where your mouth is. This is what happened with, you could have been one of those brands in 2008 when Facebook opened their API and said, let's sit, let's sit it out. Let's wait. Right. Or you could have been the brand who opened a Facebook page and learned by doing what it means. You could have been the brand who said, let's wait with e-commerce. Or you could have been the brand who was a pioneer to e-commerce and have already been way ahead of the curve uh, against the competition. And same goes with the app store, same goes with websites. There's always a wave. Now we're talking about something that is really, really fundamental from a human behavior because we're talking about something that is slightly different. It's virtual worlds and it's human expression in a slightly different way. And everyone is trying to figure out how it connects to the physical world. And I think that's a TBD. To, to the question of cost, yes, you can experiment today. You can come to the Roblox platform with an investment of, I would say, in a, to do something meaningful where you can really experiment and learn and build something of value. I would say you're probably looking at a minimum of two two $250,000 to really build an initial experience that you can launch and really start learning from and expand over time. Some brands spend half a million, some brands spend one million, some brands may spend even more. It really depends on what you want to accomplish, what's the time frame of the, of the experiment, what are your objectives. And one of the things we're doing when we're talking and working with brands is really sitting down and making sure that even if it's not super social, it's going to be the partner because we may not always be the right partner. At least we give them some education on how they should pursue what they're doing because one of the lessons I've learned is if you pay, if you go cheap, you will pay more in the future. And so there needs to be a certain level of minimum investment because you're talking about worlds in 3D that are persistent, that are real time, and with a lot of art and, and engineering that needs to be put in place. And you don't want to do it haphazardly because it will probably not serve your purpose anyway. The way we looked at it, there were a couple of things that I, I learned along the way. Um, I was fortunate to work with Super Awesome and dub it. It was great. We looked at it as a persistent world that was going to last in in theory and perpetuity. So it was not a one-off. I know there are, there's, I look at it as three ways. You can have always on, you can have sort of a tweet campaign like Gucci did. You can have an event, you can have a concert or an event. So those all, those three things have different cost structures for obvious reasons, especially the long-term one, because you have to update it. You cannot let it sit. It gets boring and the fans don't like it. So that's that was a big learning for us. The second thing was you do need to pay uh, media dollars to promote it within Roblox. That's an important component. Uh, the One of the biggest lessons that I learned was the way of promoting the content. And one of the ways that we looked at the benefit of having this content was the fact that you not only have the experience in game, which is so critical, but we brought in creators. And I do want to get to the creator part 
uh, that like Megan plays who at the time was, you know, just busting out as one of the biggest female Roblox creators. And so we would have creators play the game and record the content with kids, with fans. And that was amazing because then they post it, post it on YouTube primarily, but they post it's 12, 15, 20 minutes of content and you get significant engagement that way. This is like the secret of Roblox marketing. I tell everybody, I don't see a lot of people doing it. This is once for free. And so the other thing you can do is you can look at that content. The gameplay can almost be a narrative in itself and you can create characters. So we used one of the characters and made it, uh, made her a TikTok star for a minute. We had a little, some content that we set to music and have them dancing as the characters. So there are other ways to do this. And I think that having that set of parameters um, and understanding going in is really important. I don't know if, I, if I'm missing something specific, but feel free to add. I, I would, I, I think you're spot on. These are great call outs and, 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 and takeaways from your own experience building on the platform. The, the one other thing that I would mention that I think is really important is starting to build the community around the experience way in advance of launching the experience. Because of one of the things that you've mentioned, Jamie, that is a big challenge on the platform, it doesn't matter what brand you are, is creating awareness for the experience. Is making sure that when you go live, even if you're a big brand and people know about you, you want to 10x that. You don't want to wait and you don't want to be dependent on media spend and advertising dollars on the platform, which you can do. And so influencers are important, but starting to build the community from the early stages of development is also really, really important and putting it out there. So when you go live, people already anticipate and they get excited and jazzed about the game that you're going to launch. I think for some brands, it may not work because maybe they want to keep it confidential or under wraps. Uh, but, but that brings me to another point, which is, you only gain from exposure. You only gain from building a community and making them part of the experience. And so if you do have a possibility as a brand to start building the community around the experience on Roblox early, way in advance of launching the experience, I think it will really enable you to build a passionate group of early adopters who are already excited before you even launched. And when you launch the rallying cry is going to already bring them and give the game the exposure it needs from a community standpoint as well. The idea of community is so fundamental to marketing right now. It's the conversation I have as often as I possibly can. Uh, community as a strategy, that's, a, that's not my phrase, but I think it's so important. But do you need a different, shouldn't you be building community? I mean, I think that's the part of it is like, if your community is already in this age, is in this age group in particular, they're probably already looking at Roblox to some degree, but do you need a specific Roblox community separate from the traditional brand community? That could go many different ways. It's kind of an, I hadn't really thought about it that way. In my opinion, yes, because I think there is a very unique perspective that Roblox users and players have, and they are very passionate about the platform. And so you may have an overlap where some of the community members in your wider community as a brand are already part of your Roblox community, but maybe they're not. And also it depends on the age. In Roblox, a lot of the under 13 year olds, you can't really build a community with them outside of the game because they don't really participate in places like Discord or Twitter. Some of them do, most of them don't. <laughs> Which is frightening. 13, they are on Discord, right? And, and, and they can join communities on Discord. And you will always have many more players who play the game than people who engage with you in the community on Discord. Um, Way more, because not everyone wants to join a Discord community. But what's unique about Discord and, and, and the notion of developing a community, your most passionate fans are going to be on Discord. And that group of early adopters, I think, is a really, really precious community, no matter what their size 
the size of the community. Okay, so that's another metric, right? So I was going to get to, we've now set up sort of strategic questions to ask yourself, part one. Part two, what are some of the things to plan for and the budget ranges? And part three is what what does success look like? And obviously that goes back to parts one and two, but build a community should absolutely be one of your metrics. What kind of numbers or other parameters do you think are important? Well, I think that when we talk about these things like a, like a game world, like a community, it's really important to make a conscious choice. Are you in it for the long term or you're just trying to experiment? If you're just trying to experiment, okay, just let's, let's, let's make sure that that's clear. But if you're building for the long term, you really want to make sure that you are already thinking about what are you going to do with this experience in the future? So let's assume... It's, if it's a persistent world that is always on, obviously one of the things any brand needs to understand, you're going to have to continue and maintain that experience. It's not going to maintain itself. And Jamie, as you said rightfully earlier, the moment you launch the game, that's not the end. That's the beginning of the experience. The live operations, the maintenance, this is where you're really building the product and the community. If a brand think about the launch time as the end of the process, you're already, you already kind of lost half of the game. So that's the first thing. If it's a persistent experience, that's great. If it's not a persistent experience, well, now you have a world that you've created. What are you going to do with it? Do you want to do seasons? So do you want to take a period of two to three months every year and do something in that period of time? Do you want to do something in shorter time frame, like every few months you want to do an event or make the experience come to life? Um, so really thinking through with whomever you are partnering with in building these experiences on if things go well, what is it going to look like? Are you going to keep it live? Are you going to want to do events? Are you going to keep it as a persistent experience that is always on? Are you going to shut it down and you don't want to invest any more money? It doesn't mean you're going to have to do that. All I'm suggesting is that you think about what are those next steps and have different scenarios of how are you going to deal with it if it works? Because a quarter million, half a million, a million dollar are not insignificant investments. And you're definitely going to want to think about it in a thorough way. Otherwise, you might miss an opportunity of really taking advantage of this initial investment. Well, Jan, this has been the best. And thank you so much for joining us on Everything's Better with Creators. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard today and will come along with us as we navigate this journey to the promised land of the creator economy. Make sure to subscribe or follow our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you like to listen to audio. And of course, we'd love a rating and review if you get the opportunity. Special thanks to Jan Ross Friedman for joining us. Make sure to check out more from Whaler and all things at the intersection of talent, partnerships, technology, and creativity at whaler.com. And follow us, of course, on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For Everything is Better with Creators, I'm Jamie Goodfriend. We'll catch you next time. Better with Creators is produced by Whaler. Whaler, we power the creator economy. Learn more at whaler.com.